Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to everyone already here on Zoom. Uh, those few people who are still joining us and also those who might be watching on the live YouTube channel. Um, I'm Colin from Open Lab, Colin Watson. Um, and just to let you know, this meeting is also going to be recorded. Uh, this Open Lab demo session is the first of four such sessions in the week long HCI Summer Festival jointly organised by jointly organised by Northumbria Technology for Humanity, North Lab at Northumbria University, the Centre for Human Computer Interaction Design at City University London, and Open Lab at Newcastle University. Uh, we've got two demonstrations today. Um, as I mentioned, please remember the sessions are being live streamed and recorded. Uh, so any video, audio or text contributions you make will be captured as well as broadcast to all participants. Uh, we ask that you abide by a few rules so the festival will run smoothly. If you could try to keep your microphones on mute during the demonstrations. Uh, feel free to drop questions into the chat as they occur to you as we go along, uh, as we have time after each demo for questions. Uh, but you can also use the raise hand function at the end or the chat facility again to ask questions uh, once we get to that point. Uh, if you want to use social media, please use the hashtag HCI Summerfest. And um, it's recommended that you have your screen on speaker view for each demo, and you can use gallery view for discussions afterwards if you prefer. If you have any concerns or problems, please contact Emily Barker, who is moderating the session. Emily, could you maybe post a message to the chat window so everyone knows who you are, please? So um, there's a message from Emily. Thank you, Emily. So first up is Jay demonstrating the GABA app. Over to you, Jay. Yes, brilliant. You can hear me. Everything's good. OK, um, I'm going to share my screen. I have a little presentation. I'm just going to share my desktop and then swipe over. This is the one. And then I think I can hide the video panel. OK, great. Can I have this panel? Okay, doesn't matter. So you can hear me? Uh, yeah, I, I assume you can hear me. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Is everything okay? Yeah, okay, great. So I'm Jay Rainey, researcher in Open Lab in Newcastle University. Today I'll be talking about a technology, a platform that has been developed through my research. So my research is primarily interested in how we can use digital technology in qualitative research. Oops, hold on. So I frame the qualitative research process as a workflow because although there's lots of different sort of methods and practices that we do, they kind of all follow the same sort of pattern where we come up with an idea at the very start. So we might be interested, for example, in understanding you know, HC, how people are using HCI methods in, in sort of times of COVID. We'll prepare you know, which methods we're going to use. That could be an interview schedule, workshop, and so forth. And we'll go and collect that data in typically in audio format, and then we'll analyze it, which we might transcribe it, and we might work with the media, and then we'll create sort of typically written reports that we publish and disseminate in that way. Now, across this whole process, it's of course very individual. I might do analysis in Word or in, you know, in Airtable or some other process. You, you, you might use qualitative data analysis software. You know, your colleague might even use a different technology. So why I'm very important across this workflow is that the, how the data is handled and prepared is very different for each person. So, so nowadays, qualitative research is being used in industry extensively. And I'm not just talking about big you know, companies like Google and Facebook and whatever. I've also been in very small organizations that I've worked with a lot in my research, small local charities. And they're very much interested in capturing the sort of experiences of their service users, not only to understand how they can improve the service they deliver, but also to sort of tailor the experience that they deliver for their service users and, and sort of in, and improve, improve their organization to some extent. But the challenges they face are essentially, whenever they do interviews, for example, which is the kind of key method that they use, this captures a lot of quality, raw sort of audio data that they then struggle to work with. So this is primarily due to time and cost to analyze and transcribe it. And typically you'll find that only one or two or a small number of people in those organizations are sort of 
it, it's, it's their responsibility to do this analysis essentially, and also the dissemination. So their workflow is very different to sort of qualitative um, researchers in that they're very much interested in asking quite open questions, gathering evidence for some internal purpose and answering those questions. So what I've done with Gabber then is how can we design digital technologies or digital tools for each step of this qualitative workflow? So what I'm gonna do now is do the demo. I'm gonna, gonna walk you through how that looks sort of in practice. So I'm still sharing my screen. So essentially there's a website, which hopefully you can see now. And the idea is that it's on the website where you, you do the sort of ideation and preparation stage. You have projects, so we click on projects. These encapsulate all, all the other phases. So what you want to capture, that's where the data will be stored and that's where you, you will do the dissemination. However, how each of those steps occur in Gabber is quite different to a typical workflow as we'll see now, because very key to Gabber is capturing the, the voice of people and using that raw audio data. So what I'll do now is, this is an example I created yesterday where you know we're, it's a project about research methods in COVID. We can see that there's conversations and you can do other stuff. But what I'd like to do now is create a new project. And it's gonna be along the similar lines called HCI methods and COVID. And then we can type some. So this, whenever, whenever we create a project, this is what appears in a mobile app which is where you can create conversations around those different sort of projects. So th this will all become clear in, in, in a second. But this is the preparation and the, the preparation stage. So here we've created the project. We're in the process of creating the project. We can type in methods, we'll get an image. And this is what appears, or maybe we'll type interview. This is what appears in the mobile app. So this is fine. This is just so other people can differentiate between it on in the app and on the website. But actually what's really important in the Gabber process is whenever we're capturing interviews, typically, um, we will have a, an quite open-ended questions. But Gabber is quite different in that we're very much interested in capturing informal conversations. So what we'll do is use even more kind of open-ended topics to structure the sort of data capture. So I'll write, so if we're interested in ACI methods and COVID, one thing we might want to know about is sort of the, the, meth the sort of tools, digital tools people are using or just like technologies people are using um, challenges they've experienced and the innovations they've used, which might be different to tools, for example. The description is just what the project is about. So understanding HCI researchers experiences of research in uh, COVID times. And the two other two important parts is we're gonna capture audio conversations in a minute. They're gonna come back up to the website where we can collaboratively analyze those. How the analysis process works is we have, we use a code book to structure kind of annotating the audio. So one thing we might be interested in is, you know, we can either do it inductively or deductively. We can create the codes now or later entirely up to yourself. But we'll create two now and we'll call those. Also, if, if you can think of any other topics that might you might want to add there, just write in the chat and we can edit those later. So for example, we'll just write innovation and um, to, to tools, for example. And in Gabber, projects can be public or private. Public means anyone in the world could see it. So if we create this as public and you use Gabber, you'll be able to see it. Private means just myself, the project creator, and all the members. This is important because if you're discussing sensitive topics, like for example, your experiences having sort of experienced or had COVID, then you probably don't want that to be in the public domain. So let's create this project. So we see it appears in the website here. So if you go on gabber.audio, you'll see it. And it's kind of just how it's set up. You go in the conversations, there's nothing here. No one's created any conversations. So that's the next step. We've done the ideation and preparation. We had an idea. We've discussed with our team, you know, what the topics are going to be, what type of, how we want to sort of capture this data. Now we need to collect it. So what I'm going to do now is show you how that works. Show you how the data collection stage works. Just one second. So Gabber is a mobile application. 
for the data collection. So if we type Gabber, I thought I'd just install it and I'll go through the process now so that we kind of see how it works in practice. If we can find it. Hmm. Oh, there it is. So Newcastle University Research Gabber, tap install. And then we're installing it. So one second. So now if we open it. Whenever you open Gabber, you'll kind of get, you know, the different steps. So in Gabber, you choose a theme or a project, you add members to the conversation, and you have your conversation, as simple as that. So let's log in. So whenever I log in, we'll see that we have all those themes or all those projects. The one we just created will appear at the top. Here it is. But these are all the other ones that I'm a member of or I have contributed to in the past or which are public. So we see that those are the three topics we created. So you can imagine the capture process, you as a team may, for example, create the project on the website, but you might ask your participants to go and capture conversations within their community. So let's get started. So we're gonna have a conversation, or at least I'm gonna have one with myself. Um, so up here in the corner, we can add who's taken, who else has taken part in this conversation. So for simplicity, I'm just gonna write Zoom. So everyone here on Zoom. You have to use a real email because it's quite important because there's a consent process attached to this as we'll see in a second. So we click continue. Each project in Gather is a research project. So you essentially have to consent for your conversation to be part of research. And the next part is informed consent, which is what we all do with research, you know, but it's all typically paper-based and you know, these things get lost and so forth. What we've done in Gather is embed that within the data capture process. So there's essentially two options. Anyone in the world could list our conversation or just me and all you, the, the Zoom listeners, um, but we'll make it public. And the other option is just which language we're speaking. That's just so that we can filter conversations on the website. So if we click continue, so this screen is probably one of the most important within the app. This is where we not only capture the conversation, but it tags the conversation based on what we're talking about. So for example, HCI methods in COVID, if I was to interview you right now, and, and we're not going to, but if I were, were to, I would ask you, you know, tell me how technology has sort of had an impact on how you do HCI research. And then you tell me, and then as you're telling me, you talk about some of the challenges, and actually you find that using technology maybe isn't the best, and you've come up with some other approach, like using um, paper mail or something. And that's quite, I think, quite innovative. So I, I tap that. But what, what we've done there is we've covered everything on what typically is an interview schedule. We can jump back to ones if we find this interesting. And once we're done with the conversation, you tap that and it's, it's done. And then we'll upload it now. Now it's uploaded. What happens next is there's an embargo period on the audio conversation. So that means only I and the other email address can listen to this conversation for the first 24 hours. After that, it becomes, you know, dependent on the consent option, it'll be available. And then within the app, there's a few other settings, such as like changing the language and so forth, but that's mostly just to support using it in different contexts. So going back to our sort of workflow earlier, we come up with an idea. So we've done the ideation and preparation. So we created the Gabber project. We have now captured a conversation. And the next step is analyzing that conversation. But actually, typically a step before that is this informed consent process. So you'll see that I received an email from this Zoom demo and also to myself at, at J Rennie. So this is just says I participated in a conversation and I can review my consent. So if I tap this, it'll take me to a page where I can listen back to the audio. It, yep, that's kind of what I just said. Um, what the project is, and then I can update my consent. So I can, for example, make it so that only I can have access to the conversation. Then you just tap update and it will change. And the audio will then reflect that on the website. So the next part then is doing the analysis. So if we go back to our conversations over here and we refresh, we'll see the conversation that we just had now appears and it shows you who took part, but it's kind of pseudo anonymous because we can clearly tell this is Jay Rainey, but we don't know who the interviewee or the participant is. So if we tap on the conversation, now what, what happens is we see the audio conversation, but it's being tagged based on what we were talking about. So if we were to play it, 
we know this part's about technologies, we know this part's about innovations. So that way, if we're actually only really interested in listening to, to content about innovations, we can just jump to that part, right? The other thing is, of course, the analysis stage, you've got to listen to data like quite a lot to get familiar with it. What we typically do also is make sense of it, analyze it. So in Gabber, we do that all directly on the audio because key to Gabber is using the original captured conversations. So what we can do is we can tap this sort of plus button, creates a comment, and it, it by default, it chooses like 10 seconds and an area to annotate the audio, but you can just move it around if you like. Then you can write a textual comment. Um, oh, I didn't think of that one. Not only can you write a textual comment, but you can also annotate it. So here, you know, I find that what this person said was, you know, innovative. So I've tied it as innovation. We tap it there. But maybe at the start, you know, I'll add another comment and say, you know, here Jay's talking about tools, for example. And I'll say that's great. Um, hadn't heard of our table before. Although, of course, we're not really doing analysis with these comments, but it's just to sort of demonstrate, right? So that's the analysis stage. But you can imagine with the if you were to distribute the Gabber app either within your research team or within communities or organizations you're working with, you would get a lot of conversations appear in here. And then you would be able to analyze all the conversations directly on the audio. But going back to our workflow earlier, there's one step missing and that's the sort of dissemination. As HCR researchers, we're very good at writing um, reports and papers and, and, and creating really nice outputs. But for the organizations we've worked with, they very much are interested in capturing the raw experience of participants and then using the original media, so audio, audio conversations for internal purposes, such as training other staff, you know, to better understand their service users or using that to inform service delivery. So what we've done in Gabber is we've been heavily inspired by sort of Spotify and we've added this sort of idea of playlists. So here we've have the conversations that we analyze. If we click on playlists, you'll see those are the two comments that I made. So, oh, I didn't hear that. If I click play, I can just listen to that snippet of audio. So just the commented area. So I speak in like this, yeah. And then here's the other one, and it's the same. So if we had lots of commented audio, these would appear in this big list, and then we can listen to them in turn. So in essence, we would only listen to what our research team or our community thought was the most interesting parts, given they commented on them. The other thing is over on the left here, we can filter these conversations. So if I'm only interested in the tools, the, the comments about tools, I just tap that and I can listen. But of course, that's just listening to the conversations. We want to pr produce an output. So what we can do is create a new playlist. So you can do that using this button here, or if you just tap the plus, and then I'll write COVID and uh, HCI methods demo. And then you have to write a description, but we'll just paste that in. Create. So now this appears at the top, so we know it's active. It now appears over there, so we can edit, delete, and so forth. But we want to put that conversation into our sort of playlist. So we can do that. We can add, you know, many. We can change the order, we can delete ones that we, you know, are not, we think no longer belongs there. So this way we can create really short playlists that we can then share with others, either through social media or through the Gapper platform. The final thing that I'd like to say about this, of course, is that because there's lots of conversations, if you want to listen back to this particular snippet, you click view conversation, it goes to the audio and it kind of jumps to like where you need to be. Then you click play, and you can listen to that bit. So that's, to, judge it, to basically recap, Gabber allows or supports everyday people and also researchers to engage in qualitative practices right from inception of the idea they're interested in collecting data about, capturing audio conversations and making sense of those audio conversations in a very inclusive and accessible way. And key to Gabber has been working with 
practitioners or non-expert researchers to ensure that this system that we designed meets their needs and by extension it will meet the needs or it will at, le at least accommodate aspects of how researchers engage in these practices. So is, oh, sorry that's a black screen. So that's the demo of Geber. That's all current aspects of it I've covered. So now I just want to talk briefly about how it's been used. So there's a, a Kai 2019 paper. If you go onto this URL, that redirects to my Google Scholar now, so you can see, easily find the papers and so forth. You can also check out Gabber and Gabber.audio. But in this, in this Kai paper from 2019, it talks about the three case studies I undertook to iteratively design Gabber and the challenges we faced. So this was in, across three contexts, one within sort of weekly feedback within it, a postgraduate class. The, the, this, the final one was, was peer feedback for students who were learning qualitative research. So they would go out and interview people, then collaboratively analyze each other's conversations to give informative feedback. And the, the middle one, which is in green, was art was the most long term. And it was working with a local charity who were interested in capturing the voices of their service users, who were people who had problems with the law and, and drug abuse. And, and what they wanted to do is use those conversations to show other people within their organization how their service users experience life. And they used a complete GABA workflow, albeit at different, you know, different uh, versions of the prototypes. And they find that to work really well because staff hadn't really heard the frontline users in, in, in that way before. So these are just some quite old examples now. More recent stuff, uh, case studies rather, is working particularly within sort of workshop delivery. So Rosie Bellini um, used Gabber in a case study where she was working with an organization who was delivering very sensitive training on domestic violence, and well, perpetrators of domestic violence reflecting on their behaviors rather. And they used Gabber within the workshop, you know, at like lunchtime and at the end of the session to give feedback on how the session could be improved. The staff members then listened to those conversations, made sense of them and improved the following week's sort of workshop delivery. Another example is Delvin who used Gabber in India to support again, workshop delivery to support volunteers learning from one another in how they go about doing a particular type of volunteering. So those are just, so these examples are all very much co-located a more recent example, oh, I can't move, um, is work that I've done on the Talk Futures uh, platform. So this is in collaboration with the International Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent Societies, so the IFRC for short, their central governing body for the Red Cross, and it was a global humanitarian organization, 192 um, countries they work in. But essentially, they were going through an they were going through a future forecasting process where they want to see. How, how should our organization change in the next 10 years? And what they would love to have done is interview every member. So there's like 19 million volunteer, uh, volunteers and staff, right? And ask them, you know, how should the organization change and so forth? But unfortunately, the team, the innovation team is only two people and that's not really scalable. So what we did is we collaborated and redesigned Gapper into this new process called Talk Futures, which had roles and responsibilities. And it was, it was quite different. But what that allowed us to do is move from a co-located sort of workshoppy activities and using Gabber to one that's globally distributed. And this presented lots of really interesting challenges. So we had members from different countries recording interviews with local people um, that they thought were experts in certain topics. Those interviews would go to a website like you saw and other members from other countries would listen to those and analyze those. And then this last phase, the dissemination, the playlist, we did that in a very different way in that we wanted to create content that could be shared on social media platforms. So I've, this is from a paper this year in DIST 2020, which occurs in July, I think, but I made a video and it's on YouTube, tf.jawr.me. It's unlisted and it's gonna be, you know, in the DIST conference, but you can have a sort of sneak peek off it there if you like. So that's kind of my demo and, and hopefully that's explained not only what Gabber is, but how it's been used in the past. Again, you can use these links to find out more about um, 
the papers and also the top futures sort of process. So now I would like to take questions. That's okay. And I'll stop sharing my screen, I think. Wait a minute, yeah. Thank you very much, Jay. That was very interesting. Um, perhaps we could just uh, show our appreciation for that before we get right to the questions. So, um, if anyone has any questions, please could you either raise your hand or uh, if you were to write something in the chat window, we can then switch to you to hear your question. Um, yeah. But uh, while that's happening, um, Jay, I just wondered, um, I wonder if you could tell me what other apps were maybe influences in your design of GABA? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it varies quite a lot because as you've seen, there's kind of different parts to the GABA workflow. The capturing tool was, I mean, the whole process is definitely, in, it's inspired by qualitative research practices, capturing interviews, making sense of those, using qualitative data analysis software. Actually, you can use in vivo, you can put in your audio and you can do all the you know analysis there. But this is reported as being extremely underused by researchers. It's only like 1% like or something like this use it. And the problem is, which hopefully I made clear at the start, is that qualitative research practices, there's just there's so many methods and approaches, which is really nice because it, it promotes flexibility. But when it comes to design and tools like in vivo, they're just so verbose. They try to do everything. Whereas in Gabber, we, at the start, we said, we just want to use voice. We want to make voice clear and prominent through the whole process. How can we design around that? And in doing so, that means that everyday people can, can associate and feel familiar with this because it's either their voice or people they know and using practices they're familiar with. So for example, the coding is also familiar with tagging content online or doing hashtags on Twitter. The playlist, if you've used Spotify, it kind of looks like it's right, it's cousin, let's say it's, it's kind of quite similar, in many aspects. So those are the tools that have really inspired the Gabber process. I, I should say that Gabber is, it's, obviously it's free, it's, it's, it's available online. You can use it for your own research, which many others have done. It's also open source. So if you're technical minded, you can actually run your own version of Gabber on your own servers and so forth. That might be useful if you're doing a clinical study, for example, and you need to post all this yourself. So yeah. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Remco's got a question. Uh, Remco, did you want to unmute and ask your question now, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank, thanks, Jay. Um, my question is, uh, do you also recommend using Gabber for focus groups? I think it's definitely possible and it's something we've done in the past, but we find that I think it depends on the size of the focus group because of course, one thing that's key to Gabber is being able to annotate, you know, when people are talking about things. Mm. So if you were leading that focus group, for example, that might be your responsibility. And so I'm sitting at a table now, for example, having three or four people around here would be totally fine having the phone and positioning it away, you would require reasonable quality audio. So it is it is definitely possible to use it that way. And that's one thing I really like about Gapper is its flexibility. So you can use it for focus groups, workshops, one-on-one -on -one interviews. You could even do remote interviews over Zoom, like I kind of did a demo of. But one thing that is, yeah, so hopefully that's answered your question, yeah. Does, does everybody, like everybody in the focus group then get access to what everybody said and is able to work with it? Yes. So if at the start of the focus group, you were to add the, so you, you open the app and you say, who add members, add participants. Those are the people that have taken part. So if I would add myself, cause I'm there and Remco and Bing and Alex were all in this conversation, I put in their email address. Then afterwards you will receive an email where you can view the conversation. You can update your consent. You can then listen to your conversation. You can analyze it. One thing that I guess I didn't make clear in, in the presentation is that not only has Gabber been designed with sort of practitioners, everyday people, but one thing that we're very much designed it for is to be inclusive and accessible and, and participatory. We want people who might be typical subjects in research to engage in these practices, to do the analysis with us, or, or by themselves to do the dissemination because 
they are the experts in typically what's being discussed. So for example, if you're going back to COVID, but if you've lived experience of COVID, then there's no better person to listen to others and, and, and analyze those, that content. And because of that, that means we've worked not only with lots of different community groups who have used Gather, but that way it's designed to really support everyday people using it. So if, for example, one thing you could do if you're doing focus groups is you could probably train someone in five minutes to use it. And if you had lots of tables, then they, they could do it themselves sort of thing. Does that answer your question? It does, cheers. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you, Remco. Um, something else that just passed through my mind while you were speaking there, Jay, was uh, is, is there any application potentially for machine learning here? So this is a, I guess it's a contentious topic in qualitative research. Um, but for me, at least qualitative research is, is a very human process. But within Gabber, we also want it to be as, I guess, human as possible. So we have voice, but we're annotating the voice. But you could imagine using sort of like NLP to transcribe the audio and using those transcripts on the website to better support searching of content. Um, but what I wouldn't want is to try to, you know, start automatically coding content and saying, oh, this is about this topic, which might be useful, but it really depends on how it would be presented. But it also means that other aspects like this dissemination um, could be used, could use the transcripts in ways that are a lot more creative and, and perhaps fun. It's one thing that we're very keen and we've explored in the previous case study is when we spoke with participants, they want to know, you know, who's engaged with their content, how has it been used in the future? You know, if it's been used in a report or if it's been shared on social media. So all these engagement metrics is, you can imagine doing really nice things with those on the website. You know, you could say, if you've got five interviews and one of them wasn't used. It's really important to know that no one actually listened to that conversation, despite there being a report written about this media. So yeah, hopefully that's answered your question. Yes, interesting, thank you. Um, Abdullahi has asked in the uh, chat whether you could share um, some of the extra links that you've perhaps put in your presentation slides. We've already put gather.audio in there, but yep. perhaps your personal website that you mentioned, um, that would be useful for people to just uh, follow up afterwards. Yeah, so I've kind of made a redirect. So this goes to Google Scholar. Yes which contains the papers. This goes to a YouTube video, which is the disc presentation about Top Future, so our collaboration with the Red Cross. And if you're interested in looking at the content produced from um, the Top Futures process, you can go on the, this website. So this is also a redirect, um, and it'll go on to the kind of the Top Futures website that we use to kind of do the online campaign. So if you click those, they should work. Um, it might be a little is slow. There but... Is there an email address that you might want to share, Jay, just uh, if people want to contact you? Or... Yes. Jay, don't do anything. So, oh yeah, so one thing I forgot to say is that towards the end of the presentation, so you should definitely check out Gabber on the website. But now that we've created the project and we've kind of done that in a, everyone knows what the project looks like, I'd recommend that you download the Gabber app and give it a go. Because for me, at least once you've done it once or twice, you kind of better understand the complete workflow. I know I did a, get a, a, a demo to everyone, but you can imagine going and chatting with your sort of flatmate or partner or whoever, um, just to kind of see how atom participants work, how the consent process works, how analysis works and so forth. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, are there any final questions? If anyone wants to say anything. Perhaps not. Um, okay, so just one final round of uh, virtual applause for Jay. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Great. Um, Thank you, Colin. Thanks for hosting and, and, and sorting it out. Thank you. Great. So th thank you for everyone. So I think we're now ready to uh, move on to our next uh, demo. Um, Bing is demonstrating his work on sleep assessment. So over to you, Bing, thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, this is Bing. I'm the first uh, PhD, uh, sorry, I'm the second year of the PhD student working in open lab machine learning groups. 
So um, I'm going to show you guys with my screens. Uh, let's have a look. <clears throat> all good? Can we all see that? Oh, great. Yes. Yeah. So um, this, this is the work um, I recently completed for um, East Week or, or sorry, for Inward or you become. Um, it's um, it's a sensing of the sleep using multimodal. Um, in terms of the um, okay, next. So in terms of the motivations, is uh, we all know the sleep is very important to um, all of us. So um, so the lack of sleep, such as the sleep deprivations or long terms, or can increase the um, alertness reduce um, and always such as the Josie driving accidents um, it can also be related to our um, health issues such as the increase of likelihood of developing the obesity um, it, it's for the long term of the um, accumulated sleep deprivation or um, living in the poor sleep qualities that can also influence our mental health such as the depression um, extreme negative mood, and um, maybe also can contribute to the suicidal thoughts. Um, it's happened on all age, especially like I say in children. So the lack of sleep or the poor of quality of sleep, not only just influences their school performance, but also will be contributed to their um, behavioral problems. So economic wise, the lack of sleep or poor sleep qualities can result in a significant of loss in the um, in terms of the economic perspective, such as in the UK, it's cost about uh, estimated uh, 36 billion a year, which is equivalent to 1.86 percent of economic growth. So back to the sleep. So um, sleep stage is one of the uh, most important term um, uh, aspect to um, measure the sleep. So in clinical settings, we have five sleep stages. These are the sleep stages broadly accepted by uh, most of the sleep practitioners on the sleep clinicians worldwide. It's, um, it's ASM definitions. So those are the EEG signals, which are the brain waves from, as you can see from the right hand side. Um, we have five sleep stages. Um, so the weak and the uh, REM, which, which is the most times that we see our dream happens. And those definitions of the sleep stages, uh, most times are defined by the frequencies. So they're measured by the sleep, um, sleep waves. And the N1, N2, N3 are the non-REM sleep, which is non-rapid eye movement sleep, such as the N1 and N2, sometimes can be combined together. People normally call it uh, like a uh, light sleep. And N3, most times it's called a delta wave or slow wave sleep. As you can see from the uh, brain wave chart, the frequencies are really slow. And uh, most time people call the non-REM sleep st uh, stage three uh, as the slow wave sleep or deep sleep. Most time we know the effect of the deep sleep is repairing our bodies. So there's a typical sleep cycles that's broadly um, available online on in the sleep medicine books. So we, as a healthy adult, we experience about five sleep cycles during the night times. So at the start of the night, as you can see from this chart, um, the non-REM sleep dominates the most of the times we spend on sleep. And as we approaching to the morning, the REM sleep are become the dominant sleep stages. So the sleep stage transactions is like uh, we lay on the bed, our body can start to relax and prepare to enter in the sleep stages. So during this time period, our um, breath and also the heart rate and body movements are gradually reduced. So after we experience the non-REM sleep stage one and non-REM sleep stage two, then the body going to the repairing process, which is called deep sleep or non-REM sleep stage three. So a typical healthy adult will experience four or five sleep cycles. 
So imagine sleep. As you can see from the left hand side, uh, that's myself. I uh, experienced the one night in the sleep laboratories. So this is how um, currently we conduct the sleep assessment in the laboratory environment. So it's a pretty um, uh, labor intensive and also time consuming and it's uncomfortable as well. So um, the equipment they use is called a polysomnograph. It's a PSG equipment. It's typically consists of about 32, 64, or 128 channels. For each channel, that means a sensor will have to attach on the skin. So such as the left ones is the 32 channels. There are um, eight EEG electrodes fixed in my, um, in my scope and inside my hair. So the whole installation process take probably about one hour to finish. So um, my sleep is pretty painful and the cost. So from the right hand side, as you can see, um, in recent years, we have um, some progression on the variable technologies such as Fitbit and the ActiGraph equipment. So um, go beyond of the variables, the nearby equipment is also one of the most attracting solutions as well, such as the Bedit, which being bought by the Apple um, they're using the um, cardiac um, signals to sensing your sleep. So um, we're going to unpack a little bit more about this polysomnographic. So in order to accurately measure sleep, we have to collect the EEG, which is the brain waves, EOG, which is the eye movement. Eye movement is, called, um, is related to our dream, which is also called a rapid eye movement sleep, which is also uh, a derivative to REM sleep. So EMG and EKG are used to measure the muscle movement. Like EMG, it measures the chin muscle movement and EKG measures the, um, the, the, the cardiac systems um, like the heartbeat uh, uh, and also the uh, heart rate variabilities. Uh, of course, we also have many other of the uh, modalities or sensors they use to sensing the sleep like uh, um, the air flows, which most times been used to assess whether a person have a CPAP or any other respiratory uh, problems. So um, the variable, the, the PSG was a gold ground truth, but it's tedious to install on the, it's, it's not a practical solution for day-to-day -day monitoring of sleep. Um, go, going to the latest eras of the variable sensing technologies, we can see there's a lot of uh, um, uh, variable equipment such as Apple Watch or Impedica shown on this slide. And also um, there's um, innovations on the ring side of the wearable, like our rings. And those equipment are really a small size and um, they're suitable for day-to-day -day varying. But there's a question to come into um, our researchers' mind is uh, how accurate are they and why, why they work and in which way they work. Um, so because of this, um, commercial or consumer equipment are generally a black box. We don't know too much about how they collect this data, how do they process the data, and what algorithm do they use, and how accurate are these? Can I use it for my studies or not? So this come into my research is automated sleep sensing technologies. So we found um, recently there's a data set called um, MISA, um, which is, is um, medical research studies that's been collected by the Harvard Medical Schools. Um, um, since 2017, this data set has become an open access data set. You can apply for a license to use it and for without uh, costs. And this data set is um, so far we know the largest uh, only open access data set with, um, with ECG, which is a um, heart rate related um, signals and also active graph. So the participants in this data set in, uh, used in my studies is um, consists of about 1,743 participants. Um, the age group will be um, an aging adult with the average mean or, or the mean age of 69 years old, which we all know um, the, by, the age, by the age increasing, the sleep structures will be becomes um, more and more complex and the less sleep times happened in the older adults. So this is proposed a critical um, and very interesting uh, thinkings for, uh, for me to using this data set as a study. 
Um, so in terms of sleep monitoring data processing for this, um, for this data set, we extracted their RR intervals, which is also called interbit to interbit intervals. Um, we also extracted their activity, um, their actigraph counts. That's those two modalities used in this study because um, for most of the wearable equipment, especially for the commercial um, wearables, those two modalities are broadly available from this equipment. So for any of the machine learning or deep learning uh, models we train, we train on these data sets, later on, they can be used for fine tune or trans uh, simply adopt some of transfer learning technologies that can be used for um, population level studies. Um, so for the pre-processing stage, we only eliminated their non varying state. And um, for the feature extraction sections, we extracted their time domain, frequency domain um, features. Those features are um, mid-level summaries about this data because um, from this active, active graph counts, it's quite um, difficult to understand what happens in the short time period. So we have to come with some human understandable uh, features uh, if we want to follow with the health and the clinical research settings. So after the feature extractions, we did the normalizations to make sure all of the features are normalized to before going to the training and um, testing process of the machine learning. So here's the one of the examples of actigraph. So we have us using a sliding window method with overlap one sleep epoch. So um, from this chart, you can see the, um, we have a one, two, we adopt two sliding window strategies. One is the center window. Another is um, uh, using the window over the past five sleep epochs. Um, the, the window lengths are varied from one to 19. So for each window length, we, we, we adopt these two strategies to extract their statistic features, such as mean standard deviations, and mean, um, minimum values, and the maximum values. So on the right-hand side, you can see examples of all of those two um, window. Uh, the features come out from that. So in total for uh, active graph, we extracted about 370 uh, features for, for one sleep epoch. The heart rate variabilities. So we're using, because we're using the IBI, which is also called uh, RR intervals, which is the interbit to interbit intervals. So we extracted about uh, 30 statistic features and those features are clinical relevant features. They broadly used in cardiac research. Those, those features are used to describe what happens during this 30, time, uh, 30 seconds intervals. And um, uh, it's used to describe our um, heart rate variability. So after we finish this uh, feature extractions, we have two strategies to do the machine learning tasks. So the left hand side are the traditional statistic machine learning models, such as the follow work machine, random forest. Those models are broadly accepted in most of the uh, clinical sleep research. On the right hand side, are the neural network based models, such as the convolutional neural network and the long short term memory network. Those are broadly used uh, in today's um, time series um, um, classification tasks. So um, we have different window lengths because of this sleep is a complex the physiological activities. It's not only just the short term um, signal, a window of the signals are valuable to the classification, but also for the long terms of, or for a large window size is also valuable for uh, classifying those sleep uh, stages, which those experience was given from the sleep technologists when they annotating these sleep stages. <laughs> so in terms of evaluation methods, so this bit of a tech, tech, technique, so for the, for the left hand side are uh, the classical machine learning evaluation methods on the sleep epoch levels. So we prioritize their, uh, prioritize the F1 scores because the data set is imbalanced. Most of the records are related to sleep. It's only a small portion of the data related to wake. So on the right-hand side, we also propose a new 
uh, we also evaluated the, those algorithms on subject levels or in population levels. We conducted the t-test, for example, to see if one particular algorithm outperform another algorithm on the population levels. If, if just in case this algorithm's performance are not come from random chance, we also reported their uh, mean and standard errors within 95 percent confidence interval. Um, in addition, we propose a new metric called a time deviation. Um, <coughs> sorry, the time deviation is used to measure per subject, um, such as it's, it's a bias, like um, um, it's usually, usually interpreted to the sleep practitioners or clinicians, see how many minutes an algorithm systemi well, uh, systematically predict um, a per night sleep, or in other words, we want to know if uh, if one algorithm will systematically over and overestimate sleep or underestimate sleep. It's an intuitive understandings for uh, on the minutes levels. So two sleep stage classification is the first task happened um, carried out in my research. So uh, we have two modalities. So we have an uh, activity count and also high rate variabilities. The purpose for we to do this multimodal sensing, we were trying to understand, um, apart from this general available accelerometer, accelerometer sensors, if we involve into this uh, um, HRV data, will this contribute to the performance improvement of sleep week classifications? But surprisingly, we found activity alone can do a better job than combined sensing, which is uh, contradictory to our understandings. And we think there's a bit more interesting studies such as phys uh, sleep physiology need to be carried out in the future studies. And um, the F1 score, the highest F1 score that we achieved for sleep classifications would be 87.6. The second task performed in our study is the sleep stage, um, three, st three sleep stage classification. So in this case, as we can see from this um, tables, the multimodal methods all performs the, the single modalities um, methods significantly on the population levels. And the time deviations in minutes, um, I will give examples for explanation like a RAM sleep, um, LSTM 51, that means the LSTM with um, window length 51, um, it's um, systematically underestimate RAM sleep with about on average 10 minutes. So here's a more details about the uh, four tasks. Um, because of the four, uh, the four sleep stage and five sleep stage classification are prone to the error of the misclassification of the non-RAM sleep. So I didn't show them in the table, but from this chart, and you can see this is the confusion matrix. Um, ideally we want all the diagonals with dark blue colors. That means the algorithms successfully predict every single sleep epoch correctly. But as we can see, as we're increasing these sleep stages um, to three, uh, to four and five sleep stage, um, you can see the algorithm is struggled to distinguish non-RAM sleep stage, which means it's either further studies needed to improve these algorithms, or we need to bring more modalities to discern those two, those three or two um, non-RAM sleep stage. Um, here's one example of sleep stage uh, classification. The, the picture shown on the top are the ground truths, which is the PSG gold annotations. The photos show on the bottom are the algorithm prediction performance. And we can see from this chart, it's um, um, the, RAM, the RAM sleep prediction isn't too bad, which most times it's predicted um, roughly correctly. And, um, uh, but the non-RAM sleep stage are missing, especially for um, non-RAM sleep stage one. We also proposed a, a simple uh, ensemble method to improve the performance, just showing to the um, machine learning researchers um, there's a lot of different ways to improve the performance of the algorithms, such as the um, ensemble uh, pathways. So we pull out six top um, neural network classifiers with different window lengths and with different types of the neural networks, such as the LSTM and the convolutional neural network, CNN. So those are six classes.
identifiers. We did a post processing on their posterior probabilities. So um, I'm, I'm not going to talk too, too much about that. Basically, it's just like a, um, you have a six um, a different individual um, neural network, and we either averaged their predictions or we take the maximized values. And as we consider this the highest confidence when, uh, when it comes out with a sleep stage prediction. So um, the ensemble method, as we can see from these tables, um, for the F1, um, it has significantly uh, improved the prediction performance in population level. So there's uh, some questions um, coming in our head. Um, why multimodal works? So here's a shape. Um, it's um, it's a expectation based um, mathematical modeling to explain um, how each features contribute to the final classifications. Um, as we can see, the left hand side are two sleep two stage classification sleep and awake. The right hand side are three stage sleep classifications. As we can see, increasing by increasing the um, number of sleep stages, which is the fine grained sleep uh, stage classifications, those those HRV features are becoming gradually more and more important, especially like the high frequency and um, high rate variabilities, and um, they normalize the low frequency high rate variabilities. Um, those figures, those um, modalities or features are critical to discern non REM and REM sleep stage. Here's uh, the chart for four, step, four stage sleep classification and five stage sleep classifications. Um, as we can see, by the most complicated um, sleep stage classification task, five stage sleep stage classifications, the HRV features are becoming more and more important than the um, activity counts. That means that based on activity counts, uh, it's incapable to do any of the sleep stage classification for all, for the number over three. Um, so it's also an open source project. You can find it out from the GitHub. Uh, the GitHub will containing all of the data pre-processing and feature extractions and also training and testing uh, process. Uh, we can, we also working on this project as, as this paper was just accepted uh, last week. Uh, I mean, published, formally published last week. So there's still some work we are undergoing, such as we're trying to make um, a web interface. Uh, you can, anyone can run it on their local PCs to once they collect this um, um, high rate of variability data and uh, also the activity counts data, they can predict those uh, sleep stages on their own PCs come with them, um, a simple in intuitive understanding about how a particular night of sleep um, looks like. So I think uh, probably this is um, all of the recent work for this demo. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Bing. Perhaps we can just have uh, some virtual applause. For the... uh, well, that was uh, uh, fascinating and I'm pleased to know that sleep is so important to us in our lives. Um, uh, just a quick question before we, before, before we uh, pull other people in. Um, when you had all those sensors on you in, in sitting in the bed, was it uncomfortable or possible to sleep at all? Um, yeah, I read my sleep report. Um, the sleep technology said um, um, probably I'm a light sleeper, so you left her. I'm sorry, I think in my internet connection is still. Uh, yeah, it was, it's a, it was a little bit, little bit garbled, a little but bit, you, uh, but unstable. Could you yeah. try perhaps turning um, your the, video it's, off? It's extremely uncomfortable. Yeah, okay. One second. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, did you want to unshare your desktop as well? Okay, just one second. Um, but yeah, yes, the sound quality has improved dramatically. Yes, thank you. Oh, great, thanks. <coughs> yes. Sorry. So you were saying yeah. about the uh, sensors. Yeah, um, it's extremely uncomfortable um, because all the cables was wired on the body. So when each time when I turn, I'm either to be 
be stopped by the cables or I pull the cable out, have to, um, have to stick the cables onto my skin again. And also so, uh, from the um, sleep uh, classification report, the technologist said, uh, I wake up about 44 times a night. And um, the sleep laboratory was conducted in the ICU environment. So it's extremely noisy as well. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, so um, if anyone has any questions, if you could either um, raise your hand or uh, put something in, 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 in the chat uh, and I'll either try and spot that or Emily will alert me if I, if I manage to miss, miss something. Um, but you, you, you uh, Bing, you mentioned this time deviation um, metric. W was that something you developed yourselves, or it's some, is it something some other people are using as well? Um, yeah, we we've seen quite a lot of um, machine learning related sleep study papers. Um, most of the papers are only reported, like say accuracy or kappa mm. or whatever figures. End of papers, we have no ideas about uh, how the prediction looks like. Like say. Um, Maybe sometimes we know the, the, the algorithms, for examples, we know the algorithms for, um, for using in active graph. Um, it's tending to underestimating the week after sleep onset, which means it's really not good to capture the wake up times during the nighttime sleep. So those, those effects, those, those results are not available in most of the machine learning sleep papers. So we, we say, okay, we need to let people understanding the figure, what's the figure meaning behind that. Um, so the time deviation will explain whether uh, algorithms will systematically um, underestimate a particular sleep stage. For example, in, 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 in the PowerPoint, for three, uh, for three sleep stage classifications, we can see um, LSTM is obviously underestimate the REM sleep okay. on average about 10 minutes. So if you're using this algorithm, you, you see ah, probably for, for this, um, there's, a, there's a variance about 10 minutes. I have to be careful when I'm using this, um, um, this algorithm in my studies. Yes. And um, is, um, I can see there's, um, it was interesting to see the charts, how the, uh, depending on how many different classifications of uh, sleep that you're trying to actually identify using machine learning, how that varies in um, accuracy and, and what's important in, in, in measuring. But are there perhaps uses for this, which mean that, shall we say, a, a lower degree of accuracy is, would actually be good enough for uh, whatever's been investigated by the, uh, the medical practitioner? Do they need to know all the detail or is that excess information sometimes? Um, yeah, that's thanks, Colin. That's a really good question. <clears throat> so when we start to do this, um, do these papers, so we have the same questions. Like say, when I was trying to do um, my um, master degrees, um, I did uh, sleep studies with, um, on the HCI side, uh, which means I collect the data and I process the data. And then the people comes with a question: Is uh, um, if your algorithms comes, if your algorithms say um, have about a 70% accuracy. And then if I use the algorithm, if when, when I interpret this result to the participant, the participant says 70% um, accurate, that it means I will have about almost the two hours variance of your, 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 your estimations. So this is a really a question that it's really hard to answer because two hours, that seems like quite a lot. So it could be underestimate, it could be overestimate. So when we, um, during these papers, that's where we have to um, report this 95% um, confidence intervals to give people um, understanding for, for instance, if clinicians, they're using this algorithm, they say, ah, okay, this is the standard error range. I have to be aware of aware this, this range. The algorithm is not perfect, but at least I know how inaccurate they are. If that is the right. answer. Yes, that's, that's, fair. that's good, thanks. Um, I see Jay's uh, copied in the, the, the link to your, um, um, your, your GitHub um, account there, which is great. Um, does anyone have any final questions? Uh, I'm not seeing anything. So um, shall we just have a 
some final virtual applause again for Bing. Yeah, thanks everyone. <laughs> if you can reach me from the GitHub Peter as well, if you have a question about this, that is. Great. And did you want, um, could you put your email address perhaps into the chat as well, Bing? Yeah, so the email address is posted to here. There we go. Great, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Bing. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you, Emily, for moderating and for everyone's participation. Um, so we're we're about to finish this uh, this particular demo session. Um, now remember, there are um, demos again tomorrow at eleven thirty on Wednesday and on Thursday. And in fact, tomorrow we have Haran speaking about computer vision based uh, crowd counting, and myself on a uh, digital physical hybrid diary toolkit for welfare benefit claimants. Um, uh, next on here between one and two, this particular room remains open for people to stay around to chat and mingle. And then at two o'clock, the Not Equal Network Plus will be presenting insights on democratizing access to digital technology and services. So uh, I look forward to seeing you all uh, later. <laughs>